Good morning or good afternoon everyone, depending on where you're joining us from, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tarek Odali from Business Review, and I'll be your host. It is our pleasure to have Imperial Logistics with us today, who will be presenting this webinar titled, Imperial Logistics is Building the World's Only Blockchain-Enabled Pharmaceutical Control Tower. Today's guest speakers are Clinton D'Souza, Director of Public Health, and Bernard Gour, Vice President, Sales and Marketing for Pharma and Healthcare One Network. You'll be hearing from them in a moment, but first I'd like to welcome you to our webinar platform today. So you'll notice it's fully browser-based. If you do disconnect for any reason, just click on the link you received via email to immediately rejoin the session. In order to ask questions, you can send those in via the questions widget. So type your question into the box at the top left-hand corner of the screen, then click click Submit to submit the question. We'll try to allocate some time at the end of the session to address any questions or thoughts that you may have. If you click on the green resource list widget at the bottom of your screen, you'll be able to view or download some PDF files that are relevant to this webinar, so go ahead and interact with that. Also, if you click on the survey widget, there are some questions in there for you to answer in order to provide us with feedback, and you can do this at any time during or after the webinar as well. Please use the yellow help widget at the bottom there if you do require any assistance, technical assistance, and you can also move, resize, and maximize any of the windows in front of you to get a better view of the slides. So if there's some small text on screen you want to see it, bigger, you can go full screen and uh, look at the slides in full screen. There's a button at the top right-hand corner of your screen. But now, housekeeping out of the way, please allow me to hand you over to today's first speaker, Clinton, over to you. Thank you, Tarek, and, uh, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, it is my great pleasure to, to join uh, Bernard uh, on what we think is a very important discussion to have uh, and to, to share with you what Imperial Logistics in partnership with One Network are up to in the area of, um, of uh, blockchain, blockchain enabled control towers. So with regards to um, you know, why, why are Imperial uh, building a blockchain enabled control tower, the primary reason from our perspective is patient safety. Uh, and uh, we, we, we will talk about how we do this through two primary strategies, that of serialization and authentication, and obviously we'll go into some detail on that throughout this presentation. A little bit of context, Imperial Logistics move approximately 400 million patient packs of medicine on an annual basis, the vast majority of these through, throughout Africa. Um, the, the biggest problem we're trying to solve is around fake counterfeit and substandard medicines. Uh, just for some context, the, the global pharmaceutical market is, is around $1.1 trillion per annum, uh, and about 21 billion of that, uh, just under 2%, is, is spent on the continent of Africa. Um, and so using the WHO uh, 2017 report uh, around uh, fake con counterfeit and substandard medicines, uh, with one in eight, uh, one in ten medicines being um, counterfeit, uh, that means that this market of uh, of illicit drugs is a very substantial one in in the continent of Africa and indeed globally. Um, but as a as a sort of African based logistics organisation, this is our primary focus. So there's some stats available there. I think the most alarming one is that 42% of these substandard and falsified medicines are indeed found uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, which is where the majority of our organization um, uh, takes place. So uh, just uh, one or two slides on, on who Imperial Logistics are. Um, we are a, uh, a, a, an organization born out of South Africa um, and currently work across um, 50 countries, the majority of them in Africa and Europe. Um, we work across seven industry verticals, uh, as you'll see along the left-hand side there, and obviously I work within the healthcare vertical of Imperial Logistics, and, and that is the focus of today's discussion. Uh, in terms of you know, what Imperial Logistics actually do, um, we offer um, transportation services, uh, warehousing services, uh, both domestic and international freight management, as well as synchronization management. And again, uh, our control tower strategy will talk a little bit more to that. Um, the way that we face healthcare, and, and in fact all our clients, are really through three primary solution offerings. The first one being as a value-added logistics service provider. 
Um, the second being uh, what we call route to market solutions, and this is where we act as more than just a logistics service provider, but we in fact get into the trading, uh, buying and selling of products, commodities, uh, and in healthcare, we are pharmaceutical wholesalers and distributors uh, across many of the geographies in which we work. Uh, and the third part is really around providing supply chain management solutions, either through uh, what we call managed uh, managed logistics, which is where we take over part of our clients' operations and manage them with our resources, our staff, our systems, etc., as a service to them, or in fact offer them advisory type services uh, around supply chain optimization and or technology solutions that enable logistics um, functionality and, and performance. So this uh, rather busy busy slide um, is just to rep just to demonstrate a representation of who Imperial Logistics clients are. On the left hand side, specifically our healthcare clients, and on the right hand side, more the global brands with which uh, we are associated. Um, as as a little bit of um, uh, background, uh, the healthcare uh, vertical within Imperial Logistics represents approximately 12%. Of the of the combined revenue um, of of Imperial Logistics and also represents our fastest growing sector. Um, as you'll see on the left hand side, it's not that easy to see, but uh, we have a we have a good mix of uh, multinational uh, pharmaceutical manufacturer clients, uh, global donors. Uh, international NGOs, and we do a fair amount of um, business directly with governments as well. All right, so moving on to the sort of key purpose um, for today's discussion, I um, wanted to start off by talking a little bit about, you know, what is the rationale for the partnership um, that Imperial Logistics have embarked upon with One Network? Uh, you know, what are we trying to to implement um, here? And so with this, this, this issue of patient safety at the sort of center of what it is we're um, proposing, um, we're e effectively uh, adopting two, two strategies that we believe uh, can, can try and counter this, this scourge. The first being uh, patient pack serialization, um, right from the point of product manufacture through to the point of consumption by patients. So that is the universe that we're trying to uh, interface with and manage. Getting back to an earlier slide for a moment, where I uh, uh, shared that Imperial Logistics manage about 400 million patient packs of product a year. Um, if we consider throughout the life cycle of the supply chain that each of those patient packs would get scanned uh, approximately 10 times, that would represent just in, you know, for our part of, of the supply chain, uh, about 4 billion scans. And so uh, what we're trying to demonstrate with this slide is to say that if you attempted to interface amongst all the stakeholders in the supply chain, manufacturers, freight forwarding partners, um, above market distributors in country, distributors and wholesalers, through to points of consumption like hospitals, clinics, pharmacies, and down to patients, um, if you did this trying to uh, adopt a legacy approach of one-to-one -one digital interaction, uh, we believe that there would be uh, a near impossible, if not completely impossible, task to try and accomplish. Uh, and so really the only way that we believe uh, one could sensibly go about trying to adopt this um, this approach would be through a, a digital platform type approach, which is which is what One Network um, offers, and uh, Bernard will certainly talk more to this a little bit later. But essentially, what we're trying to um, adopt here is the use of the One Network platform and have all those actors within the supply chain, of which you know, Imperial Logistics are one, um, interface directly within the digital supply chain, allowing for real-time data movement um, between all the actors and uh, offering a single version of the truth. And so uh, as we talk about the sort of uh, scale of 
the challenge ahead of us, uh, we believe that this is, the, this is the only sensible approach that we could adopt, and obviously I'll be elaborating a little bit more. Right, so uh, what we're talking about here is uh, we're trying to represent two components. The first is, um, on the left-hand side, is just to give a nod to the uh, the work that does that is being undertaken within Imperial Logistics uh, within our own ERP environment um, that really um, needs to align with this overall strategy. So we need to have the internal capability to receive, uh, store, pick, pack, dispatch. Uh, product at the patient pack level. Um, obviously, from a legacy perspective, we've only ever managed commodities by, by you know, product name, batch number, expiry date, etc. And we're now talking about doing this at a, at a far greater level of, of detail. And so there is some work that, that is required there. On the right-hand side, um, really try to describe uh, what we experience from the um, on the public health sector. So what what this what this is trying to demonstrate is that you have a global a global supply chain which is enabled by donors and the PSA stands for procurement services agents uh, and so all the major global donors the the United States government the global fund etc the UN agencies all appoint procurement services agents who act on their behalf receive their funding and place orders with manufacturers, which is then the second block. So you have multinational drug manufacturers, either generic houses, uh, most of those in, in, in places like India, or in fact the innovator uh, uh, guys who are based in, in Western Europe and um, the United States and, 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 and elsewhere. Uh, so they would place orders on the manufacturers, and the manufacturers would then deliver those goods, this is a public health setting, just to, again, to to countries and their central medical stores. That's what the CMS stands for. So um, you would have products moving from multiple manufacturers to multiple countries um, at, the, at their central procurement level, their central medical stores level. And then from there, they would move those commodities down into healthcare facilities, uh, which is the HCF acronym, uh, in country, and that, depending on the on, on the, the setup within the the, the, the country, would have uh, provincial stores, could have district stores, and then all the way down to healthcare facilities, and finally to patients. So you're talking about kind of four or five layers in the supply chain once the product is in the country, and several layers above it. Um, from uh, people placing orders through to manufacturers uh, and obviously freight freight handlers in between uh, global freight handlers so and in in the case of of public health unlike you know potentially in in the, the the private sector and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment each one of these from an IT systems perspective run their own their own environments so the manufacturers each have their own uh, production systems each of these central medical stores have some or other warehouse management system. They then have uh, separate systems down at the provincial, at the district level, and sometimes there are multiple systems, one at the provincial, one at the district, and down into the patient system, which is yet another system. And so if we talk about trying to track a patient pack through a supply chain, we're talking about handing data off between, you know, a dozen systems, something like that, uh, maybe slightly less than that, but significant numbers of systems. And again, thinking about uh, the previous slide, if we tried to do this in a, a legacy way, you're talking about trying to transfer these you know, millions of patient pack lines of data between all these systems all the way down the supply chain. Uh, and to get that all reconciled, um, is very difficult. A a good example would be some of the legacy challenges we face, which is uh, we're running a, a a stock a stock count for a, for one of our multinational clients in our in our current environment. We'll close off our system at 
quarter to 12 in the evening and take uh, begin the stock take uh, process and the client will close their system off at 1 1 a.m. an hour an hour later hour and 15 minutes later and already there because today's environment is working non-stop there's transactions happening all the time you have a synchronization challenge uh, and so even in a relatively controlled environment where you're talking about a matter of minutes or hours, you would have synchronization issues, and we experience those currently as um, as a service provider to manufacturers. And we're talk, you know, if we talk about this in the, in the public health setting, um, we're talking about synchronizing systems, you know, daily or weekly or monthly. And so the, the to try and get this all synchronized and squared away, um, would would make it extremely difficult uh, if you try to think about this in a in a legacy way. So, implementing a control tower offers Imperial Logistics the capability to gain real time visibility across uh, all the areas of of our business in healthcare, uh, both on the public and the private sector side. What, this, what we're trying to demonstrate here are the, the various actors within the healthcare supply chain, starting with external suppliers. Um, these would include things like API, the active pharmaceutical ingredient manufacturers, which represents 70% of uh, what a, a, a pharmaceutical product is, uh, and as well as all the other components of, of, a, of a drug um, the actual casings and packaging materials, etc., and so being able to track all of those components is a, is, a, is a very important part when it comes to patient safety, because oftentimes it can be something wrong with the API itself that created a problem with the drug, um, versus just something that went wrong in the manufacturing process. So being able to track at that level right at the very beginning is important. Moving through to the manufacturing the manufacturing sort of slice of this. Uh, and again, if we think about uh, a typical multinational manufacturer could have generic manufacturing in places like India, could have uh, innovative product manufacturing in, in places like the United States, uh, Western Europe, uh, and, and other places. So they would have various commodities, sometimes the same commodities, manufactured in different sites. And so being able to track the components as well as the finished product from which site, etc., uh, is, is, is very important. We then get to this middle piece, which is the logistics part, um, in which Imperial Logistics is a component. Other, other actors in that, in that realm would, would include freight forwarding partners, downstream transport and delivery partners, uh, as well as other, other distributors. A typical uh, manufacturer would appoint multiple distributors and wholesalers, even at the in-country market level. For example, in the United States, three major wholesalers represent 90, 95% of the drug distribution market in the United States. So this is a fairly consolidated one. In countries in Africa, you could have 40 or 50 wholesalers making up that percentage of the market, where the top three or four represent maybe 15, 20, 30% of the market. Uh, and then a whole lot of smaller guys. And so depending on the strategy of the manufacturer and how they want their product entered into the market, and oftentimes what they do is they just sell the product to a, to a distributor, and the distributor onward sells the product down. And so being able to track and trace all the way through these handoffs is a, is a vital part if we're going to put patient safety at the center of, of, of the argument here. Uh, and that really just doesn't exist at the moment. So from our point of view, uh, you know, being able to have all those actors interface into this digital platform enables not only ourselves, but our, our manufacturer clients, um, the, the folks who are paying for these, like international donors, uh, etc., would be able to see where the product that they are buying actually is being sold and moved through to. Uh, um, and then obviously the, the bottom, the, the, the second, uh, the last two bubbles represent patient outlets, clinics, dispensaries, which could be, you know, in the public sector, healthcare facilities in the private sector, retail pharmacies, etc. 
So having visibility at the patient pack data level really does not guarantee a secure supply chain or that the supply chain has not been compromised. As I explained in the previous slide, as product gets moved down from distributor to wholesaler and down the chain, these really represent opportunities for illicit product to be inserted into the supply chain. Um, so one of the complementing strategies that we're uh, deploying is that of product authentication. And really what that is, is the ability to verify the chemical identity and dosage of the drugs uh, in, in the supply chain. Um, the uh, technology that we've adopted is, is called the, the ROM and handheld technology. Uh, and really uh, what that is is a, is a rapid, non-intrusive, and non-destructive process of verifying the chemical identity of a particular drug. The, the, the picture over there that says, can you tell the difference? Uh, I forget where we uh, got, this, got this particular graphic from, but I think really demonstrates that to the untrained eye, and even frankly to the trained eye, being able to identify, physically identify the difference between good and fake product is very, very difficult. Uh, and, and I assure you that the external packaging is equally as, as, as convincing as this. So it's not like you, you, know, you, you pick up the product and it's obviously a, uh, a, a poor product. Um, you know, so the guys that are doing this, because of the, the financial incentive to, to be in the, the drug um, counterfeit business is so big, you know, these guys have become good and they have got good, uh, good packaging technology, they've got good uh, ways of producing these fake drugs and these fake tablets. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we need to have a, a real real tools to fight against this, this challenge, for sure. So part of being able to identify the, uh, the, uh, the product uh, through a digital image uh, would, would then be to have in the, in, in the One Network platform reside a library of the authentic products by dosage form, by molecule. And, uh, and then we would, we would take the the gun, which it's a, it's a radar gun, you, you scan it at the product and it, it reads the, the digital image of the product and feeds back against the, the, the library and, and pretty much instantaneously authenticates that the product is in fact uh, what you say it is. And, and the technology is so good that it can even differentiate between, say, a 600 milligram drug versus a 400 millig milligram drug. So it can differentiate the actual um, quantity of API within the, within the product as well. And the other real advantage of, of uh, adopting this approach is that you're able to scan the product pretty much at any point in the supply chain. And getting back to why a digital platform is such a compelling uh, solution for this is that you could, you could be scanning the product you know, at, the, at, the, at the manufacturing line, you could be scanning it within the in-country wholesaler distributor network. You could be doing post-market surveillance. You could be going to pharmacies and buying drugs off, off the shelf and scanning the product in the, in the pharmacy and verifying that the product is in fact legitimate and be able to try and figure out where in the supply chain, you know, this one in 10 bad drugs uh, is being inserted. So this is, this is a, we believe, a, a complementary but critical um, tool to try and address this, this issue of patient safety. So in order to transform the chain of custody, uh, Imperial Logistics are adopting three primary strategies. The first is product serialization, which I've covered, which essentially is going to enhance our ability uh, to see, to track and trace, and have visibility of these products. Um, whichever technology is deployed must be GS1 compliant as the, the world is moving towards that standard. Um, each component must be barcoded, preferably with a 2D barcode. And you know, serialization, a further and added benefit of serialization is that you're able to manage product recalls as well which we've been called upon to do in the past. Authentication, what I've just, just explained to you, and there's a, 
it's a bit small photo, but there's a there's a, a picture of the actual unit, and and scanning it, uh, scanning a, 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 a in that case a, a bottle of of liquid liquid medicine, and then the third, which we haven't really talked about yet, is is around blockchain, and so. From our perspective, why is blockchain an important component of this? Um, and the, the primary reason is, is around this issue of being able to partition and give permission of data within or throughout the supply chain. And what do I mean by that? So commercially, we would want to be exchanging data with our clients that include things like invoice value, um, landed costs, cost of supply chain costs, etc. Would we would want to have those that information and that data shared uh, between us. Obviously GSK doesn't want that data shared with Pfizer. Um, and so we need to have clear rules around who has what access to which data. Um, and then there's this issue of once you pick up an excursion in the supply chain, you pick up a fake product um, you need to have the ability to share that information with law enforcement and regulators. And again, you don't necessarily want those folks to see things like pricing information and cost information, etc. And so through the implementation of, of the One Network blockchain technology, we're able to set up these rules and these groups of folks who need to see information relevant and pertinent to them. Uh, and from our perspective, uh, we're able to share this information in a, in a very simple way over trying to manually mine through data, exclude things and send that to them and these to them. And invariably, folks get that wrong uh, and, and you end up sharing things you shouldn't be sharing. I'll let you snigger for a moment on the on the call because that's happened to all of us. Um, but really, it, this is a, this this whole solution only becomes effective if it is adopted universally. So it's it's wonderful, for example, that Imperial Logistics are making this particular effort. But what we really do need is is a universal adoption of this approach and being willing to interface and share data with this digital platform. So what do I mean by that? This is just a, a, a representative example of one particular patient script. In this case, it was a vaccine. And the, the, the point, no, I, I want to give a sort of real live example. So it's very conceivable that a patient walks into a pharmacy and gives the pharmacist a script for this combination of product. In, in, in this instance, it could well be that the very first product, the second line on this, uh, on this example, um, was delivered by Imperial Logistics in South Africa to that pharmacy. The second line was delivered by DSV, one of our South African competitors, um, to the same pharmacy, and the third line distributed by the other major distributor in South Africa, UPD. So you have one script being fulfilled by a patient that has arrived at that pharmacy from three different sources. They may or may not be the same manufacturer. So it may be that all three of these products were manufactured by GSK. But our availability on line item one was there and, and DSVs was there on the second line. We were out of store, whatever. However, this order was fulfilled. This is not a, an atypical example, I, I, I assure you. So the, the point is when you get into sort of serializing each one of these actual lines of script, in order to ensure patient safety, one would need to have each one of these products serialized and captured into this digital platform to ensure that the supply chain across the board was not compromised in any way. Uh, trying to do this through separate, through, through separate ERPs in this instance, which is a great, great example, would never work because you would never have competitors sharing data with each other, notwithstanding legal and competitions commission 
uh, challenges with, with, with even thinking about that. Um, it's just something that's anti-competitive. You wouldn't do it. So you need to have some kind of safe space where you would be prepared to share just the data that is relevant to patient safety with, with a digital platform. And this is, again, where the, the sort of blockchain thinking comes in. So as we think about implementing the strategy at Imperial Logistics, we've essentially come up with three components. The first being operational visibility, which is really this ability to receive, manage, dispatch, uh, and see the product across the supply chain from our perspective. We are launching this in 2018 in South Africa for the National Department of Health, um, who are writing this into, uh, into one of their bids. And we will use that as the springboard to future-proof this for our Africa operations moving forward. The second component is what we're calling serialization as a service. So many of our manufacturers uh, are running up against these implementation deadlines uh, dictated by regulators and just simply not going to be ready to be able to implement on their manufacturing line, have reached out to us and said, are you able to help us with serialization at the, at the in-country level? And so we're in the process of um, investigating and uh, implementing the ability to serialize product in our uh, distributor operations um, and, be, and, and then being able to actually put patient pack serialization uh, onto each product. A quick note back to authentication is that if we're going to offer this as a service to our clients, we obviously need to make 100% sure that whatever product we're serializing is in fact exactly the product that is being promised to the client. So we need to make sure, notwithstanding the assurances from our client, if we're putting you know, our name against the serialization, we need to make sure that the product is in fact exactly what, what it's supposed to be. So that would be another reason, that is another reason that we're implementing the authentication. And then the last issue, which we haven't touched on yet, is this issue of having uh, what we're calling above market visibility. And so just for a moment, getting back to this, you know, our own world of 400 million patient packs and 4 billion scans. Um, so notwithstanding, the, you know, that, that a legacy IT architecture simply wouldn't be able to to make that to make that uh, a reality, even even having all this data in a digital platform and being able to spot the product the product problems and uh, supply chain incursions is going to require some very serious uh, seriously different thinking. The old uh, way of having a couple of people comb through the data and kind of looking at these things and some exception management is great. But in our opinion, as the, as the volume of these transactions just continue to ramp up, uh, you really do need to introduce some kind of machine learning, artificial intelligence uh, to be able to build in the algorithms that help you pick up on challenges and problems as, they, as they're identified through the, this, this proliferation of data and being able to analyze data in a rapid way, identify and mitigate issues will become a a critical component of this and in our in our very humble opinion if you if you really don't think about adopting um, a similar approach we're just not sure how you would do it and uh, uh, as we were joking internally um, yeah, good luck with that and let us know how it goes if you want to try and do it with a legacy type approach so we've talked about a lot of these already um, the benefits we're looking to try and extract from this project our visibility for our clients, transparency, being able to share relevant data with uh, key stakeholders in, in their own contexts, um, cost optimization, so being able to view product all the way down a supply chain through these different handoff levels will invariably um, reveal opportunities to cut layers out within the supply chain, uh, en enabling us to take cost out as well, uh, dropping the price uh, at the pay, at the at the patient level, which um, an, another key initiative for us would would expand access to quality product, um, vendor management through performance, um, 
uh, indicators, uh, this uh, this technology, and certainly the digital platform, there's nowhere to hide. If uh, if the clock starts and you got the handoff here and you handed off over there, you're responsible for that lead time versus what you promised. And so it's going to hold everyone accountable from a performance perspective. Um, auditability and governance, very important, certainly on the public health side. You have you know these these, these wealthy countries donating you know billions of of donor dollars, uh, taxpayer dollars to these these health programs, and being able to provide them with a peace of mind that the money that they've invested in these programs are in fact trans translating into patients and patients consuming quality products, critical component um, for them for sure. And then uh, we've talked about the single version of the truth, but the ability to have early detection and alerts of uh, of any problems, excursions within the supply chain. And then, you know, a digital platform really does enable you to embrace all existing technologies rather than having to replace everything or have everything uh, communicate with, with one another. You just have to manage the product or the information flow into the, into the digital platform and you're done, but then you have access to everyone else's data. So we think that that's a really big win for all stakeholders. So in conclusion, um, key goal for us is around patient safety, um, being able to manage the complexity and quantity that's going to move, that's going to proliferate the supply chain as you move to patient pack serialization. Uh, is the only way to do that, in our humble opinion, is through a digital platform. Um, the partitioning and permissibility of information to relevant stakeholders through a blockchain-enabled um, synchronized database is, is a critical component of the strategy. And then from our perspective, in terms of implementation, it's around operational visibility, serialization as a service, and above-market visibility. Thank you very much. And uh, Bernard, over to you. Clinton, many thanks. It is very compelling to understand how Imperial Logistics will leverage blockchain to deliver serialization and authentication across your entire supply chain, which will help you deliver 400 million patient packs safely to so many patients in countries that need it the most. This is a very exciting vision, and we at One Network are thrilled to partner with you on this journey. Today we are talking about how companies in the pharma and healthcare industry can leverage blockchain to digitize their supply chain in order to improve product verification, authentication, and traceability. Clinton made it very clear this is a critical mission, a mission made more difficult by the fact that pharma supply chain is well recognized for being not only very complex, but also drastically different when you look at developed and developing countries. While the supply chain in developing countries is organized around multiple constituents, such as manufacturers, wholesalers, points of care, pharmacy benefit managers, and payers, the supply chain in developing countries is highly unstructured, leading to increased risks throughout the supply chain. And that level of risk continues to increase as the globalization of the drug trade creates longer and more complex supply chains, leading to more and more fake and counterfeit drugs reaching patients and affecting lives. This has driven an increase in requirements around traceability, serialization, verification, and authentication, and also in regulations, such as the U.S. Drug Supply Chain Security Act. Let's take a moment to examine the Drug Supply Chain Security Act because it gives us the critical information to understand how to reduce or eliminate risk in the pharma supply chain. The DSCSA is a federal standard that outlines steps to build an electronic interoperable system to identify and trace certain prescription drugs distributed in the U.S. It will require active participation from all members of the supply chain in order to be successfully deployed. The key words here are interoperable system and all members of the supply chain. The DSCSA includes three stages of implementation. First, product verification. 
being able to verify a product's chain of custody at any time by storing the transaction history between all business partners in the supply chain. Second, serialization, creating unit-level product identifiers and deploying them on lots, cases, and packages at the global scale. And third, traceability, using the interoperable system to store unit-level data at each transaction and deploying such a system downstream in the supply chain to drug dispensers like retail pharmacy chains and hospitals. All the words on this slide are very meaningful because they tell us exactly what needs to be deployed. A multi-enterprise platform that will enable all participants to share a single version of the truth from origin to destination and ensure product verification, serialization, and traceability. Now, here is the big news. Traditional supply chain deployments are not the answer to the problem. Why? Because in a traditional supply chain, all companies across the network are connected point to point many times over and manage information in disconnected silos, which is the root cause for all the frictions, delays, and inefficiencies that result in a lack of transparency, agility, and velocity and ultimately the increased risk to product safety in the pharma supply chain. Not only do traditional supply chains increase the product safety risk, they also inflate inventories and costs while causing product availability issues. Only a blockchain-enabled digital network platform can deliver the required agility, velocity, and transparency to provide the level of product verification, serialization, and traceability required to make the pharma supply chain safer and more efficient. Why? Because such a network allows all companies to be connected to a single network with a single connection and leverage a single version of the truth, which removes all the frictions and barriers that caused the problem in the first place. This is exactly the interoperable system referred to in the Drug Supply Chain Safety Act. Enabling such a network is the mission and purpose of One Network. One Network is a blockchain-enabled, multi-party, multi-tier digital network platform that enables you and your entire ecosystem of customers, distributors, suppliers, and logistics providers to synchronize and optimize your entire supply network in real time, resulting in increased product safety, lower costs, reduced inventories, higher service levels, and increased product availability, together with greater supply chain agility, velocity, and transparency. One network serves over 60,000 companies around the world with a significant presence in multiple industries including in the area of humanitarian health organizations, where two of the three largest organizations are working with one network to make their supply chain safer, more efficient, and more transparent. How does one network deliver these benefits? Very simply, the one network blockchain-enabled platform is deployed as a system of engagement that connects all the companies in your network to a single version of the truth with shared processes, shared data, and shared metrics. All parties on the network, the points of care, distributors and wholesalers, manufacturers, suppliers, carriers, and logistics providers can all join the network with one single connection, replacing or enhancing the expensive and complex system of point-to-point -point integrations across the entire network. The multi-party, multi-tier processes are defined within the network platform, and at each step of the process, a decision is made to either run the process on the network or integrate it to the system of records used by each enterprise on the network. Think about deploying such a digital network platform to enable a dual platform strategy. Simply use enterprise systems to manage enterprise workloads and use the network platform to manage multi-party workloads. Such a dual platform strategy will deliver much better and faster results at a much lower total cost of ownership. 
the structure that makes it possible for one network to help its customers enhance their product safety and supply chain transparency consists of four key pillars. Number one, a real-time single version of the truth shared by all parties on the network, enabled by a multi-party master data management system and a deep multi-party permission model. Number two, intelligent autonomous agents that are embedded in the execution layer with the ability to sense and respond as well as make intelligent decisions and execute these decisions autonomously. Intelligent autonomous agents running in real time on your execution data deliver vastly superior business results compared to batch planning engines disconnected from your execution systems. Number three, a modular and adaptable blockchain-enabled multi-party network platform that enables companies to build flexible solutions and adapt them as their needs evolve. Within the One Network platform as a service, companies can extend the One Network modules and agents or build new ones as required by their multi-party processes. And One Network has a never legacy policy, which means that all new capabilities built using our flexible and extensible platform are integrated into the product and supported by One Network at time of go live as long as you use our public APIs. You never have to worry about the solution extensions becoming legacy applications. Finally, number four, an agile self-funding and low-risk implementation and onboarding methodology that leverages a sprint approach to ensure quick time to value and low risk. The blockchain-enabled One Network platform as a service is the bedrock upon which these pillars are built. It combines, number one, a multi-party master data management system that maps master data across all partners on the network. Number two, a multi-party permission model to determine who can see and do what at each step of the multi-party processes. Number three, a modular and adaptable architecture that makes it easy for customers to configure their solutions. Number four, a highly scalable and reliable cloud infrastructure. Number five, a deep integration framework that ensures interoperability with enterprise and third-party systems. Number six, the ability to extend the One Network solutions or build new ones by leveraging the One Network SDK and publicly uh, available uh, APIs. Number seven, the agent technology used to produce the intelligent autonomous agents that help you plan, replan, and optimize within the execution layer in real time. And finally, number eight, the blockchain platform used to automatically blockchain enable all multi-party transactions on the network. One network recently announced that we have launched a network orchestrated blockchain solution for pharma. Now, why do we call it network orchestrated blockchain? Because it combines the advantages of blockchain, such as immutability, tamper-proof audit trails, and decentralized ledger, with the advantages of networks, such as confidentiality, scalability, and optimization. The One Network blockchain solution, trademarked One Blockchain, can be used for applications such as chain of custody, serialization and authentication, and transparency and traceability. What makes the One Blockchain solution different from typical blockchain solutions? Well, as mentioned on the last slide, it combines the benefits of blockchains and networks. Since all transactions are blockchain enabled on one network, you can decide which transactions you want to post to the blockchain and which ones you simply want to maintain on the multi-party network. That allows you to manage all your on-chain and off-chain transactions in a single version of the truth. Number two, it's highly scalable as the one blockchain can aggregate hundreds of operations into a single blockchain transaction. Number three, it enables the complexity of nonlinear supply chain flows, such as lot splitting and aggregation, contrary to typical blockchain solutions, which only enable linear serialized flows. And number four, it enables confidentiality and a single version of the truth, whereas typical blockchain solutions can only deliver one or the other. 
The one blockchain solution enables global fan-in and fan-out, lot splitting, blending, and aggregation, and serial-based as well as lot-based traceability. It also leverages the one network permission model to deliver differential confidentiality by role and enables tracking through consolidation and deconsolidation across every level of the packaging hierarchy. Finally, one blockchain enables IoT integration, such as the readings from the Raman handheld devices Clinton talked about related to product authentication. It significantly improves scalability by posting hundreds of transactions per second to the blockchain and delivers tamper-proof verification on the blockchain. The One Network blockchain-enabled digital network platform enables control towers. With the One Network control tower, you can gain visibility of all the transactions on the network, monitor the network in real time, resolve alerts through collaboration, leverage the autonomous agents on the network platform to deliver intelligent recommendations to the users, as well as leverage those autonomous agents to make decisions autonomously. We see a lot of demand for control tires in the pharma and healthcare industry at this time, especially as companies like manufacturers, distributors, and wholesalers realize that they need to proactively monitor and optimize their entire network to increase product safety, reduce risk, lower costs, decrease inventories, as well as improve transparency, agility, and velocity from source to destination. So in summary, One Network delivers product serialization, authentication, and traceability on the blockchain-enabled network platform. It delivers agility and velocity and transparency across the network, as well as significant supply chain performance improvements in terms of product availability, service levels, inventories, and costs. I would like to close by thanking Imperial Logistics for leveraging the One Network blockchain-enabled network platform to enable serialization and authentication in the global pharma and healthcare supply chain. And special thanks again to Clinton for sharing his insightful views on Imperial's plans to leverage a blockchain to improve product safety all the way from manufacturers to patients. Thanks again, Clinton. Brilliant. Thank you very much, guys. And uh, just a reminder for the audience, in order to ask your questions, you can send them in via the questions widget. Don't forget there's that box at the top left-hand corner of your screen. Click that and then click the Submit button once you've typed your question in. We're going to try to get to as many of these as we have time for here. So uh, let's start with this one. We received this one already. This person says, um, how widely do you think blockchain will be adopted in the pharma and healthcare industry? Who wants to take that? Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll have a go at that one. Thanks, Tariq. So, you know, from, from our perspective, and I think Bernard highlighted this really well in his deck, um, I think there are two components here. The, the first is that there is pending and uh, already implemented regulation coming down, both the U.S. Uh, US um, FDA have, have put some real rules down. I think 2023 is the, the end date to have patient pack serialization implemented. And I think the EU regulator is, is a year or two before then. Uh, and then we're starting to see pockets of, of countries regulating around these, uh, these rules as well. So I think from a regulation perspective, this is uh, something that, that all actors uh, in the healthcare space need to be thinking about and, and dealing with. Um, and then, you know, for, for drug companies and distributors like ourselves who are involved in markets that are being targeted heavily by a fake counterfeit and substandard product, for us, this is a, it's an absolute must. So I, I would say that um, either you're going to be forced to comply in the coming couple of years, or you should be doing something to protect the markets in which you're working um, from the criminal elements to try and uh, solve some of these issues. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. Audience members, please do keep these great questions coming in to us. Next one we have here, why is One Network going after the, supply, uh, the pharma supply chain? Who wants to take that? 
Well, I'll take it, obviously. Thank, thank you for, for the question. Um, very simple answer. The, the pharma supply chain, as I stated, is, uh, and as Clinton demonstrated, is one of the most complex supply chains in any industry around the world. So it's one that uh, needs the most transformation, the one that needs the most transparency, the, where, the one where you have the greatest need of product serialization and authentication. So we believe that it is an industry that is ripe for blockchain enablement, and we believe that our blockchain-enabled digital network platform will be very successful uh, from the degree of adoption by either distributors, wholesalers, and, and, and manufacturers in, in the pharma industry as demonstrated by our partnership with Imperial Logistics. Okay, thank you very much for the answer there. We're going to move straight into another question here. Uh, so um, this person has, um, has typed to us. They say, what do you think the impact of blockchain will be in the pharma and healthcare industry? So I'll, I'll, have a, I'll have a go at that. So I think from our perspective, um, and I talked a little bit about this in my, in my presentation, the issue is really around um, synchronization of the databases between the different actors and then this issue of permissibility uh, so, and partitioning. So being able to give stakeholders, groups of stakeholders, their view of uh, of of what will be relevant to them, and I think this is this is uniquely um, enabled through through blockchain technology. From from our perspective, um, you know, you have other other forces at play. Um, obviously, the pharmaceutical market is scrutinised heavily by uh, anti-competition uh, regulators, etc. And so you, you need to be careful when you start talking about synchronizing databases, people all go, whoa, 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 what, we are, what do you mean? You're going to be sharing data, you're going to be colluding and all of this sort of stuff. And so to, in order to be able to allay those sort of fears, but still be able to share data um, across actors in, who are actively either trying to con conform from a regulatory perspective or trying to discourage or weed out uh, problematic actors, etc. Uh, from our perspective, we think that the, the, the blockchain solution really helps enable that um, across, across all actors in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that can be open, transparent, auditable if there are any questions, um, etc. So I, I hope that helps a little bit. Oh, I'm sure it does. Thank you very much for the answer there. Um, we're going to try and get to maybe just one more question here. Um, so this person has, uh, has said, why partner with Imperial? I'll, I'll take that. I, I actually, I, I uh, appreciate the question. First of all, obviously, Imperial is the largest distributor of prescription drugs in Africa with a mission to change the world. So for us, there's also a, a very important purpose which is the ability to partner with Imperial to change lives in Africa. So we're very excited to be, be part of their efforts. Number two, Imperial operates the role of orchestrator on the network, connecting the dots between the manufacturers all the way to the patients. So it is the best place to run a blockchain-enabled control tower on one network because Imperial is going to have oversight of all the Supply, oper supply chain operations from the manufacturer all the way to the patient in country. So number three, obviously, Imperial is the perfect point of entry to drive network adoption, both upstream to the manufacturer and downstream to the local distributors and points of care, the hospitals, clinics, and pharmacies. Uh, so with Imperial, not only do we get the opportunity to build a global distribution uh, framework on blockchain, but also to bring to the network the upstream and downstream participants to build the network effect both up and down. 
Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for the answers there, and thank you to everybody who submitted a question today. Unfortunately, we are all out of time. Very sorry if we couldn't get to your question, but uh, yeah, we are up against it here. So let's, um, let's conclude here. So thank you very much to Clinton and Bernard for what was a great presentation. I'm sure you'll all agree. And uh, of course, thank you very much to Imperial Logistics for sponsoring this session. To all attendees, you will receive an email shortly that will tell you how you can access the on-demand version of the webinar, or you can access that through the website, which is www.business-review-webinars.com. Don't forget, once this webinar ends, today's survey will appear in its place. We would appreciate it if you could stay behind and answer the questions in there for feedback. It's very important to us what you have to say, so go ahead and do that for us, please. And we do look forward to sharing further webinars with you, so keep an eye out on the website just mentioned. You can also follow us on Twitter, if you like, at BR Webinars for daily updates, and you can join the LinkedIn group as well, Business Review Webinars. Thank you all once again, and I hope you all have a